Well, it's Friday, but before you get into the weekend mood, let's do business on Business Morning here on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. Good morning. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, let's uh, start off with the global oil space where prices rose for a fourth day, taking Brent towards three-year highs as investors focus on tighter supplies and strong appetite for riskier assets like crude and high hopes for recovery from the pandemic. Brent crude was up 40 cents at $77.65 a barrel after touching a two-month high yesterday and closing at its highest since August 2018. U.S. oil was up 0.4% uh, at $73.57 a barrel, having closed 1.5% in the previous session, the highest since the start of August. In a sign of threatening fuel demand, capacity utilization rates at the United States East Coast refineries increased to 93%, and that's the highest since May 2019. Anyway, let's see how long this bull run is uh, going to mm -hmm. uh, go on for. Let's uh, take a look at uh, what's happening back here. A total of 696.96 billion naira has been shared by the Federation Accounts Allocation Committee to the three tiers of government and other relevant agencies as revenue for August. A statement released after the monthly fact meeting for September, which was held virtually shows that the federal government got 289.25 billion naira. States received 217.18 billion naira. And 161.54 billion naira was allocated to local government councils, while the oil-producing states received 41.37 billion naira as 13% derivation from mineral revenue. However, the total revenue located last month was lower by 63.75 billion naira uh, when compared with the 760.71 uh, billion, billion naira revenue uh, shared in July. And the country's foreign exchange reserve is an set for a rebound as is said to hit $40 billion mark following the recent successful issuance of a $4 billion euro bond. The report by Egyptian financial services company EFG Herm says that Eurobonds, which has been oversubscribed by investors, will lead to an increase in foreign reserves and ease the country's FX shortages in the short term. Well, emphasis in the short term because yeah. they have the long term <laughs> to deal with. The country's external buffers were initially boosted by $3.3 billion special drawing rights allocation from the IMF, which it received on the 23rd of August. Currently, around $36 billion, the FX reserves last reached $40.4 billion on the 5th of January, 2018. And uh, Evergrande is uh, making the news now for not so good reasons. The Chinese real estate company is dealing with, you know, meeting up with financial obligations after putting in so much in building. In Nigeria, we see developers putting up buildings in the effort to uh, bridge the gap. That's our next uh, conversation yes, after the break. Yes, we're hoping that we can avoid uh, the scenario we see with Evergrande, which exactly. is affecting not just the Chinese company now. We see it affecting Europe, a lot of companies, investors. And uh, markets uh, worldwide. Yeah, you know, recently the vice president actually asked the financial sector to come into the space of bridging the gap, the exactly. housing gap. So Get some affordable housing in Nigeria. That so would let's be... not push them to the point <laughs> that they get to the Evergrande stage, exactly. you know, which we are still dealing with at the moment. Exactly. Anyway, that's our conversation uh, after the break. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. Uh, now to our first conversation. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, has charged the nation's financial market experts to collaborate with government uh, with a view to tackling Nigeria's housing problem. But this also brings to mind the issue with uh, Evergrande, the Chinese property development company struggling to deal uh, with debt it has accumulated over the years. What pitfalls should uh, developers in Nigeria avoid? And what housing scheme can close the deficit gap in the sector? That's if there's one. Well, a real estate developer and president and GMB Beast Town Group, Dr. Becky Olubukola, joins us now. Uh, good morning. Great to have you on the program. Thank you very much for having me. So economic experts say the housing deficit in Nigeria is uh, estimated between uh, 18 to 22 million housing units. Meanwhile, the Minister of Housing, Mr. Babatunde Fashola, says there's no housing deficit in the country. What's your perspective on that? Of course, everybody knows that the housing deficit in the country is large, is increasing per second as much as our economy is increasing. So we can't say there's no deficit in the country when we have homelessness across every state. IDP camp is increasing per second. Insurgency is not slowing down. 
Um, this is rainy season and the states within the river basins are getting flooded every day. So, of course, there's deficit. It's increasing. We in the industry know how badly the citizens of this nation need an affordable home, not just luxury, because luxury is relative. Is is a man who has finished eating that would think of luxury. A man who is hungry, who is looking for a shelter, a basic shelter, is not thinking of luxury at this point. You know, so for me, the deficit is increasing, and we really need to do something about it. Both the private sector, we in the industry, and of course the government needs to really think about a solution and how we can uh, bridge that gap as fast as possible. Yeah, just before you uh, talk about the solution, uh, I think one of the scenarios that come to mind when we hear the minister saying there's no deficit is, for instance, here in Lagos, if you go to the island, you see a lot of houses that are just there not occupied. So if we say that there's a housing deficit, why are those houses not occupied? Thank you. You see, for me, the, 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 private, the real estate sector is divided into two or three. There's the affordable sector, which is where we belong in Bistan Group. Because for me, 75% of Nigerians require a basic home. You know, it is the rest of the 20%, 25% that can say they have a, a, a good home. There's the luxury part and there's the middle class. If the government is talking about deficit, then we should be concentrating on the affordable part of this sector, which is where the growth is, which is where the development, the economy building, this, which is where it is. That's why you see the developed country looks into social homes, poor people's homes, because these people mix majority of the population. When there's a growth in the nation, it's from there. And when there's a problem in any sector, especially the housing sector, it is also from there. People that build and people are not living there, they are running business. We cannot compare our economy with those who are running business. They are in the business of selling luxury houses. If their houses are not selling, it is their loss. But if the government is thinking about bridging this gap, we cannot use that as a yardstick to talk about affordability and housing sector and the growth of the sector. Looking at the statistics of people who need home, you will, let, you will know that what the government needs to do is to partner with organizations, of course, like Bistan Group and many other organizations that are in affordable sector to provide affordable home, basic affordable home for the people of this nation. The, the, the movement of people from the rural areas to metropolis is increasing every day. Inflation is increasing. Our forex, of course, you can see, dollar to naira is falling every day. And, and this has caused inflation in the market. It has made it more difficult for people to actually afford these homes. This is where subsidy comes in. This is where the bridge in question comes in. This is where the government is needed. Because even those people who are building houses can no longer build the kind of houses people can afford because the cost of materials has increased in the market. But when the government can come in through the mortgage banks, equip the mortgage bank, equip the developers, and come about PPP, where the public-private par partnership comes in and help us to bridge this gap, then we will be able to provide the kind of houses that people can afford. Okay. And then that is where... We okay, go ahead. All right, but, but looking at uh, Lagos, now it seems like for you to be able to, you know... Uh, situates these affordable homes. You have to go, you know, to the outskirts. Uh, wh what do you think about that? That's where infrastructure comes in. You see, we need to look at the concept we call the metro city concept. For us, we came up with this initiative. It's called the metro, metro, metro shelter. The metro shelter concept developed by Bistan Group is helping to bridge that gap, reducing those rural areas, making them an urban area. When there's a good infrastructure development, good amenities, people will not mind to live anywhere. When there's a good road network, there's waterway um, network where people can use the waterway, like Lagos State, people have, you have water surrounding Lagos State. That's a very good means of moving around the city. We should think about rails within the city. With this in mind, people will not mind to live anywhere 
to go to their offices. The government needs to reduce the offices, the government agencies within the metro city and decentralize it and take it to the rural area. Develop those areas you call outcasts. Develop those areas so that everywhere become a city. Even your rural area do not longer become a rural area, it becomes a city. This, because this is actually where people can actually get a good affordable homes to build. In Abuja, as we speak, we have over 12 projects going on. And we are trying to develop those areas to turn them to a city. In Lagos, we have six projects going on. And we are trying to look at Ekpe, for example. Ekpe is no longer a village. Ekpe is a big town. And then that's what can happen in Ikorodu, in other areas like that. But that agree, people can live in... Everybody doesn't have to live in Leki. We don't have to live in GRA, Ikeja. Everybody can live in every environment if we have good infrastructure development. Okay. When there's a good infrastructure development within the city, people will not mind to live anywhere. All right, so you, you know, about the, the, our ministers need to look into uh, this. Okay. I need to look at how we can decentralize the city and make everywhere a town. Everywhere can be a metro, a metro center. Our okay. National House Fair event going on is about bridging that gap. When all right, we so bridge you, this you, gap, all right, people will right. be able to live anywhere. All right, all right, Dr. Becky. You talked about uh, mortgage the other time. And when we look at the ratio of mortgage finance to the GDP in Nigeria, it's only about 0.5%. Uh, meanwhile, yeah. in South Africa, it's 31%. In Ghana, it's 2%. Botswana, it's even higher. Well, is there a way to boost this percentage so that, among other ways, we can also use mortgage to bridge this deficit thank you mortgage system is a great tool in achieving metro shelter concept that we are talking about but met the mortgage system needs to be equipped we need to fund our mortgage system and when this mortgage system is fully formed because the demand is higher than the supply people are actually going for mortgage every day. But they don't have the fund, they don't have that enough fund, you know, to, to, to support the citizen, to support the people, to be able to assess the mortgage. Because you can only give what you have. Even the, even the Federal Mortgage Bank is only trying. The demand is way higher than the supply. People demand for houses in hundreds of billions, and they can only give what they have. So, but this is where we have our government coming in. The, the Federal Mortgage, mortgage Bank needs to be well equipped and funded. The other mortgage bank, the, the, the private mortgage banks, need to be well equipped and funded. Then the civil servants across the nation need to be given priority to be able to assess mortgages because these are the, these are the people doing the work. When these people are given enough opportunity to assess mortgage banks and they are able to get mortgages, you will see that the ratio will increase. You will see that the, 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 the GDP of the nation, that the housing sector have the capacity to provide, will also increase. Right now, the housing sector is not putting so much yet into the GDP and the economy nation because it is not equipped properly. We need that equipment through the funding, through enough funding to the mortgage bank, through enough funding to the, pri into the developing sector. The housing sector, the private, the, we need to be able to assess development fund. Most developers these days, you have to go look for fund at double digit. When you look for fund at double digit, how do you sell affordable? You see, the, the, the issues are enormous. Right. We need to look at the policies that guide the mortgage bank, and they need to equip that policy. A lot of amendments need to be made in the Land Use Act. A lot of amendments need to be made in the mortgage, uh, the, the mortgage Act. Several of these things, the eight assembly started it, but they didn't finish all these laws. We are looking at ninth assembly being able to pass some of these laws in place so that you will see investors coming in into the housing sector of this country and coming in into the mortgage sector and see how they can equip our mortgage banks. Okay. See, the federal government cannot do this thing alone. Okay. There's a right. need for us to collaborate all the time. Right. So we see a lot of, you know, developers advertise houses at, you know, various stages of development. Some, you know, shell units. How accessible are these packages to an average Nigerian? Okay. I'm going to talk strictly about what, how we do ours. For Bristol Homes, our projects are in different sectors. 
Every, every, you see, people try to sell to, to citizens what they can afford. We sell plots of land for people so that they can build gradually. We also sell finished products, that's finished houses, for people to also buy and pay. We have mortgage arrangements, internal mortgage arrangements that spread up to seven years. But okay, so that we can push the effect of, you know. Like, how, how accessible are these? I mean, I know that uh, you do that and a lot of people, but it's not just about it being available because we see a lot of them. Well, how can an average Nigerian <laughs> get this thing? How can, can they pay for it? Do they have uh, instrumental payment? Do they have a bank they can reach out to? Do you have data, you know, that can give you the confidence to allow these people to say, okay, you can move into the house and then later on you can pay and stuff like that. To pay gradually. Yes. It's quite accessible actually. And uh, we have some mortgage banks that cushion this that helps them to assess it. At the same time, we have the internal mortgage arrangement that gives them instrumental payment. So people can pay gradually on monthly basis. We even have a scheme called the trader scheme and the civil servant scheme where they can pay on monthly basis and pay every quarter or yearly. And they can pay as, as long as five, six, seven years. And at the same time, we also partner with about four different mortgage banks, and we help our citizens, our friends, and help the clients and customers to assess this project. You see, National so, House, yeah. National House Fair is yeah. always an avenue for people to get this information. Yeah. National House Fair helps them to get the information yeah. and help them to assess it on the go. Okay, all right. They are so able to assess this project on the go it's a, it's immediately. It's time for a break now, but we'd just like to get your opinion on this. We're, I'm sure you've heard of the story of Everground, which is going on around the world now, affecting it's yeah. majorly a real yeah. estate. And, you know, they kept on borrowing money to develop houses, and now they are in a huge debt. As a developer, what lessons would you say you're learning from the story of Everground? You see, as a developer... I've learned never to borrow money that you cannot pay back. Don't borrow money you cannot pay back. Don't put money into a project that you are not seeing the end. You have to see the end of every project before you go into the end. You have to have an off-takers that are ready to off-take those projects before you even go into this loan. A lot of our colleagues go into several loans and eventually it shrinks their project and shrinks the organization. Don't expose your organization, do not expose your business. We don't do it. We only go into project when we, there's off taker or when we can see to the end of this project. And I'm advising everyone in the business as well. You know, the, 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 the state of the economy right now, we are only praying for the best. The dollar rate to Naira is crazy. It's not a time to start going into luxury because you might not have people to buy. Go into affordable homes. Go into affordable projects that citizens can afford. And please, let us build what people can assess. Exactly. Let's make the information out there. Let's help this country and let's reduce the deficit by providing a metro so shelter project house. across the country. Thank you. Affordable Thank you so homes much. all the time. Exactly. Affordable. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Becky Olubukola, the group manager. Thank you so much for having me. And enjoy your weekend. It's a Friday. Enjoy your weekend. God bless you. <laughs> bless you. Thank you. Too. All right, so after the break, uh, we still have our eyes on that $4 billion euro bond that uh, Nigeria successfully raised, oversubscribed from $3 billion to $4 billion. Uh, how, what impact is expected to have on the market? We'll talk about that after the break. Just stay with us. It's Business Morning on Channels Television. All right, and the federal government's success raising $4 billion from the eurobond market this week is still forming conversations in the market, expectations from this success, and that's uh, what we'll be discussing with Omotola Bimbala, investment uh, analyst at Chapel Hill. Uh, Denham, great to have you on the program. Good morning. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, and good morning. Yeah, so uh, on Wednesday, the Naira appreciated marginally in the official market. Can we attribute this, success of, uh, attribute this to the success of the eurobond? Uh, well, not necessarily so, uh, and that's because, like you mentioned, uh, the movement that we had in the in the official market uh, on, on Wednesday was very, very marginal. And uh, even if you look at the the trading activity in the investors and exporters window yesterday, you would find out that Nether is still trading within within a very, very tight band, you know, of around four eleven 
uh, to fund 20 naira per, per, per dollar. Uh, so, so it's still it's still early days yet, and we are yet to see a very material impact in the in both the official market and the hand heel window. And when in fact we do see a reaction in those two markets, uh, our view is that you know the the trajectory will likely be upward rather than downward. Uh, but where we should probably expect to see a positive reaction uh, to these developments will be in the in the parallel market, you know, where we have seen. Uh, you know, the, the exchange rates, you know, uh, essentially, you know, uh, weakened significantly over the past couple of months. Uh, and we do believe that uh, with the impact of the Euro bond, Euro bond issuance, um, you know, making a, ma resulting in an increase in the, in the external reserves of the central bank, uh, that would, to a very large extent, you know, support the CBN's drive to restore stability uh, to the foreign exchange market. Uh, just to put this in context, uh, currently, external reserves, you know, they are very close to about $6 billion. And with the, by the time you had uh, the, the returns, the bond issuance of $4 billion to his, uh, we're going to see external reserves, you know, getting as high as $40 billion, which is even above the level that we had it before COVID-19 crisis. So to a very large extent, you know, that will provide a lot of ammunition and, uh, and, a, lot of, and a lot of support for the central bank to increase supply in the foreign exchange market. Uh, one of the reasons why we have seen parallel market rates, you know, uh, weaken significantly over the past couple of months is because we do not have enough liquidity in the official market. So if you are a manufacturer, for instance, or even, you know, if, 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 you, are, if, if you need, uh, you know, foreign exchange for, 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 pay, for, pay, for, for payments of services, uh, the odds of you getting enough supply in the official market is very, very slim. So we have seen a lot of people build up the parallel market, but with the CBN likely to step up its level of intervention, uh, you know, across the various segments of the FX market, I think that will contribute to 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 a restoration of stability and the narrow and the and the and the much more narrower parallel market premium uh, going forward. And even from a from a demand perspective as well. Uh, so as we all know, in every point in the exchange market, we typically have transactional demand which is demand for um, businesses trying to pay for imports of goods and also pay for services. We also have a lot of speculative demand in foreign exchange markets. And, and, and for, for currency speculators, uh, I think the, the impacts of this, you know, uh, recent zero bond issuance and what it could mean for improvements of supply in the foreign exchange market will probably reduce the activity going forward. I want to perhaps, you know, expect to see uh, a, a, an, an improvement in both liquidity and even stability, you know, of the exchange rate, particularly in the parallel market, you know, where, where we've seen a, a significant uh, depreciation over the past couple of months. All right. The uh, CBN governor had said uh, the last MPC that uh, he does not recognize any other rate apart from the INE, which is the official one. Uh, but unfortunately, like we have seen there, the parallel market still exists and the rates are really going down. I think the last was about 577 naira for a dollar compared to about 413 in the uh, INE window. Now, uh, when we look at this scenario where this, the, the gap between these two markets keeps increasing, what does it do? What is it doing to our economy? Can we simply ignore it? Does it have any impact? on the FX space and on the Nigerian economy? It does, and, and that's why, you know, central banks all over the world and even uh, market participants, that's why we typically plan out, plan out having uh, a wide parallel market premium in any foreign exchange market. Uh, and that's because, you know, when you have a wide parallel market premium, it leads to a misalignment of incentive in your economy and your foreign exchange market. Uh, you tend to see, you know, market participants, you know, and speculators investing an inordinate amount of time and resources in trying to game the system to, to run trip in the foreign exchange market rather than putting that time and resources into productive use. So it's generally, you know, a, 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 a bad thing when you have web parallel market premium all over the world. Um, and, and, and even, and, and even uh, you know, be, beyond, be, be, be beyond that, it also could have an impact on foreign investment flows into your country uh, because the parallel market then tends to become a leading variable uh, for your sports rate. And 
if it speaks to you know any foreign portfolio investor today, you know uh, who, who who allocates assets to both the margin and frontier market assets, they are all very skeptical, you know, as of now of putting an additional inflow into the country because they believe that there is a bit of mispricing uh, in the sports market in the official market. Uh, so generally, you know, every central bank in the world and every market participant in the world generally frowns at having a wide parallel market premium. That's why I believe that we need to see, you know, a lot more effort uh, that has to be put in into reducing, into reducing and low, and even eliminating completely this parallel market premium. And a number of things have to be done. Uh, you know, number one is that we need to see additional supply uh, actually come into the foreign exchange market, particularly the investors and exporters window and the official market. Uh, we do know that there is a backlog of FX demand that has to be met. Uh, I mean, and, and with the recent euro bond issuance and with the, with the strength that we are having in external reserves, uh, I believe that the hope is that uh, that will support the, the ability of the central bank to make more interventions uh, in the official market so that we can clear that backlog and generally improve liquidity you know, in, the, in the FX market. So that's the first thing. The, the other thing that we also need to do, I believe, is that we need to see more flexibility as well in the pricing of the currency, particularly in the investors and exporters window. Uh, the central bank itself, you know, um, the economists at the central bank do carry out currency valuations uh, for the NERA. And based on their own estimates, uh, it does appear as if you know, the, the official and the, and the high and deep window rate, they are overvalued by around 12%, you know, uh, which puts their fair value you know, somewhere between 460 and 470. So I believe that we need to see you know, more flexibility in the pricing of the currency you know, uh, you know, by, 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 by the regulator so that we can have the spot rate in the high and deep window somewhere very close to where the, where, the, where the implied fair value is by the central bank's own estimate. So we need to do that. Uh, but beyond those two things as well, there are that, that that a couple of other policy reforms that have to be carried out. Uh, one of them, I believe, would be for us to have a much more tighter monetary policy framework. Uh, currently, you know, thanks to the accommodative support provided by the central bank you know, last year uh, to support businesses and households, against the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen you know, an improvement in the growth profile of the country. Uh, Nigeria successfully exited recession uh, in, in Q4 2020, much more earlier than the market expected, which is a very, very good thing. And we have seen growth consolidate over the course of 2021, both in the first quarter of the year and the second quarter of the year. Uh, with that improvement in the growth profile, um, I mean, the thinking of the market is that you know, the next course of action for the central bank will be to tighten monetary policy, you know, by raising interest rates from current level. When you think about it, you know, the, the one-year treasury bills rates for the country today is roughly around 7% from the primary market. Meanwhile, you have inflation at 17%. So you have a very, very large negative bill return of, you know, minus 10%. And that acts as a disincentive for domestic savers, you know, and it leads to a lot of what you contribute to the to the to the speculation activities that we are seeing in the FX market. So 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 we, we do believe that you know currently based on the improvement that we are seeing in the growth profile and also you know uh, you know and also the improvement we have seen the level of external reserves uh, the, the best course of action at the moment would be for us you know to have a much more tighter monetary policy framework so that we okay. can reduce the level of demand you know for foreign exchange in the economy. All and right. that will contribute to lowering the parallel market premium going forward. Okay, so uh, how much uh, local participation did you uh, see in this uh, eurobond issue? Because I heard the uh, minimum investment was about uh, $200,000. Indeed, that's correct. Uh, the minimum investment uh, in, the, in the primary market for eurobond is about $200,000. But, but before, you, before I answer your question, I think it's probably best to even explain what an eurobond issuance is. So eurobond security is a way that uh, borrowers, uh, which could be governments or it could be companies, the way is, is a debt security they use to raise money externally, offshore, in foreign currency. This time around for the federal government, what we did was to raise money in US dollars offshore for the purpose of financing the government's fiscal deficit. Um, 
And typically, you know, historically, you know, Nigeria has been a frequent issuer in the euro bond market. Uh, today, we have about $10 billion of, 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 of bond outstanding in the euro bond market. Uh, but, but since we have been issuing bonds in the euro bond market, Nigeria typically does not include a local, a domestic book runner in that process. But this time around, the DMO thought it wise and a very good decision, I must say, to actually include a domestic book runner in the, in the issuance process of the euro bond. And that led to a lot of local participation in the issuance. Um, and, and, and I mean, and, 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 and that, makes, that makes perfect sense because when you think about it, as a very, a very decent pool of uh, US dollar liquidity that is available locally. Uh, if you look at the domiciliary account balance of Nigerians alone, it is in excess of $15 billion. If you look at you know, collective investment schemes of mutual funds that invest, that invest in dollar-based assets, they are in excess of $500 million. So there's a, very, there's a very decent pool of dollar liquidity that is available locally. And I believe that that contributed to the very strong demand that we saw uh, you know, from, from local asset managers, uh, from local banks as well, uh, that contributed to the, to, the, um, to, the, to, the, to the oversubscription of that hero bond issuance, and what eventually led to, to a very, very you know, decent level of pricing by the federal government uh, at, the, at, the, at the market. The markets. Now, what impact has the euro bond had on both the fixed and equities markets so far? Or is it too soon to say? Uh, so so we, we've seen some impact, uh, particularly in the, in the fixed income market, uh, but, but, but the impact on the equity market is still, is still too soon to save, and the impact is contingent on us, you know, uh, making some other, uh, some other complementary fiscal and monetary policies, particularly, uh, that will lead to improvement in foreign exchange liquidity in the market. But let me start with the fixed income market as well. Uh, so from the fixed income market perspective, um, uh, but I think the, 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 announce, the announcement of that euro bond issuance as well, it had initially led to a downward repricing of yields in the fixed income market uh, because uh, market participants, uh, or let me say, you know, uh, the, the buyers of fixed income in the local market, particularly pension funds and banks, for instance, you know, they expected that, you know, that euro bond issuance will lead to uh, a, much, a much less aggressive debt management office, you know, in the primary market for, for, local, currency, for local currency debt market. Um, and, you know, that contributed to a tightening, you know, of, of interest rates. Uh, initially, we had seen the 30-year bond, for instance, trading at about 13.5%. Uh, but, but since the announcement of that euro bond issuance, uh, we have seen the 30 year bond yield, you know, come down as low as 13%. And I think that sentiment will continue to prevail, at least in the short term, uh, in, the, in the local currency debt market, pending when we begin to see the central bank actually, you know, go the step of tightening monetary policy. So definitely, we've seen an impact in the fixed income market. Uh, for the equity market, it's still, it's, it's still too early to say, and it's also very dependent on so many other factors. Uh, but, but, but as we know as of today, Nigerian market, Nigerian equity market is, is highly undervalued. Uh, we trade on a price to earnings ratio basis of, of, of around eight times, which is a very deep discount compared to our peers, uh, both in frontier markets and emerging markets, not to talk of developed markets, in fact. So equity valuations are very, very cheap. Uh, but the reason why we haven't seen a significant rally in the equity market as of yet is basically because um, there is still the problem of lack of FS liquidity that has contributed to uh, a lack of foreign investor appetite for Nigerian equities. Um, historically, foreign investors have been a, a very, very strong participant you know, in, the, in, the, in the equity market. It contributes you know, historically more than you know, 40% to volume and value traded in the market. But since we have had this FS liquidity crisis, the level of participation has dropped significantly. Uh, and I do believe that, you know, by the time the central bank, you know, by the time they begin to raise the level of intervention in the point of exchange market to clear the backlog, and we start seeing more flexibility in the pricing of the currency, and we see a tighter monetary policy framework. And much more importantly, we see the central bank unveiling uh, a much more credible point of exchange market framework. Uh, I'm, I'm very sure that we're going to begin to attract 
growing investors once again back in the local right. equity market. Uh, all right, all right, Omafala. Thank you so much. And we do hope that the central bank uh, would actually embrace that uh, a more friendly uh, system or policy to attract uh, more FX into the supplies space. Thank you so much, Omotola Bimbola Investments Analyst at Chapel Hill Denham, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you, and you too. So let's do an opening call to the markets now. Will Ebong is here talking about the markets. She takes it further. Yes, Sine, good morning. Uh, just good like morning. Motala was just saying, we haven't seen a rally in the equities market yet, uh, despite the euro bond, the successful euro bond issuance. And uh, that's why we've been seeing the negative, especially swings in the market, especially in the negative trend. But yesterday, however, the equities market rebounded slightly from a three-day bearish trading streak as investors showed interest in stocks of flour mill Nigeria and PZ Cousins lifting the All Share Index uh, to up by 0.06 percent to 38,874.13 points, and moderating the month-to-date loss to about 0.9 percent. Total turnover declined. Uh, volume of trades decreased by 19.2 percent to 125.79 million units, while value fell to 1.27 billion. Uh, Naira from 1.51 billion Naira traded on Wednesday and all exchanged in nearly 3,000 deals. At the close of yesterday's session, GTCO emerged as one of the most traded stock by value at 270.93 million Naira. We'll move over to the sectors where we have a year. The, the, the four, all four indexes, the key indexes gained, except for the continued negative trend in the banking sector there, which thankfully was not strong enough to pull back the market. But to tell us more, we, let's bring in Richard Akimoladu, is a stockbroker at CSL Stockbrokers. Good morning, Richard. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you, Richard. Uh, Richard, uh, please tell us, the equities market halted its three days of negative performance, recording an uptrend for the first time this week. Would you say that the market is out of the woods? Uh, looking at the market, I think this oscillatory movement that we continue for now, we'll be seeing a day of gain, net day of, uh, of, uh, of uh, loss in the market. I think this will continue for now because of the headwinds that are still uh, present in the market. Uh, the market is currently dominated by, by retail investors that uh, with uh, any little gain, they are ready to take profit from the market. Uh, but with, with, uh, with the inflows that we are seeing into our reserve from uh, SDR and the euro bond that the, the, we just concluded, I think uh, uh, the country will be in, in a very comfortable zone now to settle all the backlog that uh, the FTI are having, and that might give them a comfort zone to come back to the market and actually move the market in the right direction. But for now, we continue to see this uh, up and down movement in the market for now. So speaking of comfort zones for investors, most investors do not seem to be taking a break from the count banking counter there, which has weighed down the benchmark performance index for some days. What can be done to help long-term investors hedge their portfolio? Okay. So, as you know, that uh, the market is, is for long-term investors. So, but, but currently, what we are seeing now, we 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 are having a lot of retail investors that are, are looking for short-term gains. So, that, that, that's why uh, we've been seeing uh, uh, the downward trend we are seeing in the market for now. But uh, we keep advising investors that the market is for long term. And if you look at all the numbers, usually the half-year numbers that, that came in from the banking sector, we see that some of these numbers are very different. And they came with uh, in terms of uh, telling you that the, the, bank, the, the banking uh, uh, sectors, they are still in, in a very uh, a, a good region to, to give returns to, to investors. But investors just need to be patient and ask to have long-term uh, Long term, uh, or right, uh, long term uh, outlook for the market. Uh, the market does really need a boost, and there have been efforts, I see, by the NGX to use technology to advance the Nigerian capital market. How well do you think they have fared in this regard? Okay, so looking at the, uh, the, the NGS, you've seen that in terms of technology, they, 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 they put technology in the forefront. In, pushing the growth and innovation they have for the market. Uh, if you look at the market, during the lockdown, uh, we had uh, each free 
trading, even all, all traders were trading from home and there was no issue. And that's why, uh, on the back of that, that's why the, the NGS is coming with a virtual conference that's coming up next week with the tag tech innovation. Uh, uh, they put together a lot of speakers that will be talking about uh, the, the topic, uh, uh, the topic of the day, which is titled "Technology Platform and, and Market." Uh, we expect uh, that the conversation is going to be around how to uh, use technology to advance the cost of Nigerian capital market. The, 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 the conference is, is free, but you are required to, to register, and it's going to happen next week, uh, Thursday. Okay, thank you so much for that um, insight, for the input on the program, Richard. That's Richard uh, Akimoladun, stockbroker at CLSO Stockbrokers. So, Ine, that's all we have for this, uh, today's uh, market review. All right, thank you so much, Will. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. You too, Ine. So, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll head to London, where Juliana is standing by. Welcome back to our developments from London. Now we have Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Thank God it's Friday. Good morning, Annie. Thank God it's Friday. Yeah, but uh, not very good news. We have some petrol stations across the UK are closed. What's going on? Yeah, the government um, have not been short of um, emergency meetings this week. And again, there are a series of crisis uh, talks with ministers. And the headline... Uh, coming out of London today is don't panic buy. We've already been seeing social media footage of cars piling out. And that's because last night, uh, the big oil giant BP um, said they had to close uh, tens of their petrol station. And I believe they've got about 1,200 petrol stations up and down the country uh, because a shortage of HGV drivers. And this is not a new issue in we've been discussing this over the past couple of months there are a series of issues um that has affected the shortage of drivers in the uk and it's not just bp that have been affected we're also hearing reports that esso which is the second largest petrol uh, forecourt provider here in the uk they've also had to close uh, some of their forecourts also tesco they're also being affected. Uh, but also, we heard this about Nando's, we've heard this about McDonald's, we've heard this about um, other restaurants, and it's also leaking down into the supermarkets. It is a massive issue, and the government are under increasing pressure to sort this problem out today. Exactly, because we hear they say uh, they are determined to fix the issue. Uh, does it sound like they have a new plan, anything new? Uh, well, there is actually an operation in place called Operation Escade. Um, I believe that's how it's pronounced. And uh, the Transport Minister, Grant Shapps, he's been doing the media rounds this morning. And uh, what the government is saying is that if they can't get enough HGV drivers, they will um, bring in the army. The British government do rely on the army in times of crisis. And they said that's what they will do. And I think it's really important that people understand this is not about a shortage of fuel. There is enough fuel and there is enough petrol. The problem is, according to the Road Haulage Association, there is a shortage of about 100,000 HGV drivers. Lots of critics, particularly the Labour government, they are saying that this is due to Brexit um, because so many uh, non-UK workers were, of course, affected uh, by the change in migration rules. And many of them have just not been allowed to come back. The government are really playing this down. They say that this is a long-term uh, issue, predominantly due to COVID-19 and the fact that tens of thousands of prospective drivers were unable to take their tests at that time, which is causing the backlog. Although lots of um, industry experts have rubbished those claims today. They say this is because of Brexit, really. And um, so, yes, the government said that they would draft in the army um, to take on some of these jobs. Um, but potentially, potentially, in the short term, kind of loosen uh, some of those um, uh, migration uh, visa restrictions, which the government really don't want to do. Mm, well, we hope that they do, uh, because, I mean, yesterday we talked about the issue of saving Christmas and all, and all of this is tied to uh, all, uh, the shortages and all that. Well, we'd like to talk about the market, but I guess we'll do that during uh, Business Incorporated at 1.30. So, Juliana, thank you so much and talk to you later. Thanks, Janine.
Well, let's head to the crypto market now. As normally, it's a red Friday. Yeah, but we have a mixed uh, orange. Friday we today. have it's orange quite Friday. Mixed. Yeah, we have a, <laughs> a mixture of green and red this morning. Uh, but Bitcoin is in green and uh, Ethereum in the red at 8 a.m. this morning. But our current prices are saying otherwise right now. Fear and greed index is 33 points. It's showing uh, there's fear in the market now. So traders are, are kind of worried with the price movement. Uh, we, can, we have seen uh, the 24-hour volume traded in the total market cap. Now we have $97.66 uh, billion, it's down 14%. Bitcoin dominance, 42.13%. Uh, price of Bitcoin at 8 a.m. Uh, was 44250 It uh, was up 0.78%. And uh, $33.41 billion in Bitcoin traded. Ethereum still sitting uh, above the $3,000 mark at 8 a.m. this morning. Uh, volume, $17.79 uh, billion. Suppose the market cap, we have uh, just uh, Cardano in the green there. It's up 0.81%. BNB still having that pullback. There's down 1.34%. And Solana, $143 uh, down 3.48%. Uh, um, let's bring in uh, Olumide addition on our a financial market analyst. Hello, Lumide. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Great to have you, Lumide. So uh, I see uh, Twitter is allowing uh, a tipping, a Bitcoin tipping uh, on their platform. Uh, what's, what is, how, how does this actually work? Uh, basically, um, what Bitcoin is trying, and so what Twitter is trying to do is um, they're trying to allow uh, content creators and um, have extra box on their platform. You need to understand that um, Twitter happens to be one of the leading social uh, media platforms in the world. And despite the fact that um, our federal government banned uh, such platform, it's still growing at record places across um, the youth. And um, the case about it is that because Bitcoin has a much more uh, decentralized and uh, it, it will have problems with fiat uh, exchange and currency because you understand that Bitcoin is accepted all around the world. So what they try to do is that um, they integrated with a lightning network that would enable uh, transactions to be faster. So uh, I think that's a very good one. And if okay. you look at the stock price yesterday, uh, Twitter rose almost 4%, and Bitcoin went as high as almost $5,000 before it's recollecting back to the 42000 level. So it's a very exciting thing across the cryptoverse. We are seeing right. that um, platforms are already integrating Bitcoin and um, use case into their platforms. Okay. And I see uh, right now, this hour, Bitcoin is trading about 42000 What's uh, causing this pullback right now? Yeah. So I, I think um, moving forward, we need to understand that um, the dollar happens to be one of the bank runs um, behind Bitcoin's volatility uh, just some days ago. The U.S. Fed announced that at some point they'll be tipping the economy, and that means that market liquidity will be tightened. So they are seeing um, more cautiousness in institutional investment. Another concern is that uh, Joe Biden recently um, nominated an anti-crypto and uh, anti-big bank um, regulator. I'm talking of the OCC, and that has sent some shivering across some investors. So it's possible Bitcoin test. The forty thousand dollars price level, but it's good to be seen if you can break lower. All right, Lumide, thank you so much. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah. All right, uh, so anyway, we have our top five losers here. We have uh, Make It Down there that's down five percent, and Avax and uh, Mina uh, are, are down four percent, and we have Audius there, two dollar twenty, uh, down four point two seven percent. So it's a, it's a mixed Friday, but right now it's red. Okay, so. Oh, right now, it's right. Because I wanted to say, I hope the market will make up its mind before Monday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how the weekend goes this time. <laughs> exactly. Now that it's starting on the red. Exactly. Anyway, that's it for this week on Business Morning. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm Ini John Merkwa. Do remember to join us at 1.30 p.m. We'll have Business Incorporated. We'll give you updates from the world of business. And I'm Laddie Williams. Enjoy your weekend.